Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending the last session, besides the great closing plenary, of the Animal Rights 2013 National Conference. I know it has been uh, a lot of sessions, and I'm guessing some of you did not take Don's advice to give yourself breaks, <laughs> and you have probably been doing wall-to-wall -wall programming from 9 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. I see nodding in the back. I've seen you in almost all my presentations. Uh, <laughs> You're probably hearing the same silly intro and comments all the time and getting sick of them. I wish I had new jokes. Um, I, but yes, uh, so thank you very much for attending the final session of the Animal Rights Conference. Uh, this is a really important one, and even though it's a small crowd, this will be an intimate crowd, and we'll get a lot of your important questions and answers asked in this. This is Engaging Abroad, and I am Michael Liberman of Farm Animal Rights Movement, and we engage abroad both by giving grants across the country and by mobilizing grassroots activists across the world, sorry, grants across the world and mobilizing grassroots activists across the world with our Meet Out campaign, our World from Animals Day campaign, and a number of others. But rather than spend too much time on those campaigns, uh, since we've already talked about those at our campaign report session on Friday, for instance, uh, what I wanted to do is just give about a five minute introduction before I pass it off to these more experienced uh, people on my right. I wanted to just talk a little bit about why it's our obligation to engage abroad and give a couple little ideas about what we can do that they'll expand on uh, further. So the primary reason that it's our obligation to engage abroad is that all animals in all countries are equal, right? Animal exploitation is not a US uh, problem, it's not contained within our country. It, animal exploitation happens everywhere and all lives are equally precious. And because in many ways it can actually be more cost effective to engage abroad or to basically to advocate somewhere where our money spreads uh, farther basically, where the um, exchange rates are different, it's not only our obligation to engage abroad, but it can actually be more effective to do so. You know, we can use the same amount of money and spare more animals often across seas uh, by finding somewhere where that same amount of money can can do more. For instance, one example I learned about just earlier from a friend of mine, he was talking about how in India you can print a far glossier leaflet for like one tenth the cost that you can in America. And because, and I see uh, my Indian friend here nodding, um, and because in India they're used to getting like DIY uh, black and white flyers, that glossy magazine might be, get, might be looked at like a book basically, might be. Uh, yeah. I'm a printer myself. Yeah. What's that? I'm a printer myself. Oh, you're a printer, all right, so that's exactly right. So, so that's just a little example of this one, not only will this leaflet be cheaper and look better, this leaflet actually might be seen by more people because that's like a book, you know, that can be something that five people will surround themselves and look at and as something they've never even seen before, basically, where to us we get pieces of paper all the time, right? It's just a little example. Um, the other reason it's important, um, other reasons it's important to engage abroad, well, one of them is because uh, animal exploitation is being exported right now. In the US, we're finally uh, seeing that moral arc bend towards justice, but unfortunately, a lot of the world is following our lead from decades past. And they're seeing uh, people in Western nations who used to eat more and more animal products, eating lots of meat, consuming animal products, wearing animal products, testing everything on animals, all of these things are being exported. So while we're finally banning these and moving away from these and changing our practices, other countries are following our lead from previous decades. And so we have an opportunity not just to stop the animal exploitation that's happening now, but also to stop the animal exploitation that might happen in the future if we don't act. So this is literally future, this is stopping future exploitation, which is so much more effective in many ways than just dealing with problems that are already here. We have an opportunity across the world to prevent our horrible lead from being followed. And so I said this was going to be very short, and I meant it. Um, basically, uh, there are a number of things that we can do. I know that some people said they actually want to work abroad and volunteer abroad. I have nothing to add to that, but I know that at minimum my good friend Lee Chantel does, and I'm sure some others do as well. Um, but the things that I know that we can do without even having to step, our, you know, step out of our own soil, uh, we can participate in international campaigns and days of solidarity, days of action. So what I mean by that is that there's something where you know they're protesting for across the world, even if you do it in your own country, you're still contributing to an international effort and you're enabling those other efforts to happen. Also, when there are things going wrong in other countries, you can protest in solidarity. For instance, uh, when in Spain, 
a few years ago, a number of activists were arrested for basically doing undercover investigations. We protested at the embassy, the Spanish embassy in the US, so we held a day of solidarity uh, with these activists in Spain. Uh, we can assist foreign groups with grants and funding, which you're going to hear a lot about from Don and from Kim on my right. And we do that as well at Farm, but they have uh, a wealth of experience on my right and has also a wealth of money to give to these countries, fortunately. Uh, we can basically adopt grassroots uh, groups in other countries. So we can take a group in another country, this is an extension of funding, who doesn't have the funding but we like their ideas and we can basically be uh, their kind of U.S. wing and you know, provide them what they need. So instead of just giving little grants, which is also great, we could basically, you know, let us uh, let an unfunded grassroots group become our, you know, our wing, you know, our, our, our branch in another country. And uh, lastly, of course, what we can do as individuals, even if we don't do any actual advocacy, is we can just lead by example because the U.S. influence is still large. I know that our influence is in some ways diminishing a little bit globally, but we are still a huge major player, and the way that we live is, uh, is emulated by people across the world. And just by leading by example, uh, we can show that the U.S. is no longer this proud you know, consumer of all and everything and this proud destroyer of our natural world and of our live resources. And um, so yeah, we, uh, I did have some tips I was going to try. I'll just mention these tips briefly, and I'm sure that, uh, that these uh, people can expand on them more in more detail. Um, but the, uh, the main tip I really have, and I know this is going to be mentioned, uh, is that we need to be careful of cultural differences and careful of not uh, basically, especially for those of us who are Caucasian, which seems to be a lot of us in this room, myself included, uh, not basically trying to be the white savior. Uh, in another country uh, who is not primarily made of Caucasians. Uh, another thing uh, that we should be note of is that it can be a little difficult to oversee actions happening somewhere else. So if we are funding someone somewhere else, we need to be careful that we have good metrics of success so we know that we are using that money widely, wisely since we can't directly oversee what happens. And uh, the last thing I want to say is just that um, be prepared uh, to be amazed by the results. There is so much, you know, think of all the wisdom in this room or in, in this conference, the 1,100 of us who have been here throughout this weekend. Think of that wisdom and then think of the wisdom that's going on by underfunded people across the world who want to make a difference and think of what we can learn from that wisdom and how we can share knowledge to make a huge difference uh, across, literally across the, globe, across the globe. Thank you. Or that one. I thought of an AR joke over the weekend, if anyone wants to hear it. <laughs> Steve has a very dry wit. Just, just, no, no, I want to hear it, but Steve has a very dry wit. It's the joke. Let's hear it, Steve. Oh, you're going to want to hear it? Yeah, yeah. yeah here he is now. So how do you make um, a smug, self-righteous vegan feel guilty and selfish? How? Invite them to AR conference. <laughs> <laughs> and by, now I'm going to to explain that joke, no. Uh, okay, so you're yeah, yeah, I'm gonna use that. Yeah, Liz Chantel suggested that I use that in the marketing materials next year. We're gonna make try to say that. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you for your patience. Sorry for the, the delay. Um, so, yeah. So, like I said, we fund vegan activists um, all over the world here in the U.S. and also abroad. Um, so just to give you an idea of our reach, um, this map, the um, blue areas are those areas in which we've funded projects or are currently funding projects. Um, so we do fund projects all over and we're expanding all the time. The blue areas who you funded? Yes, the blue wow. areas. Yep. So I wanted to start off with some, some good news. Um, thanks in part to the efforts of dedicated activists like yourself. Um, for the past several years, like uh, Michael had mentioned, the number of animals being killed for food in the U.S. has been on a steady decline, which is really incredible to see. Um, of course, there's always the bad news, um, which is that globally, the number of animals being killed for food is increasing at an absolutely staggering rate. Um, this is due to a number of different factors. Um, one of the big ones, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is the exponential growth of the population. There's currently over 7 billion people on the planet, and that's not 
going down anytime soon. Um, also the increased urbanization and income of developing and emerging countries, countries like China, Brazil, and India, with that increased um, urbanization and disposable income, their diets start to look more and more like their Western counterparts, so more meat, eggs, and dairy, unfortunately. Um, we're all obviously very painfully aware of the negative impact that this has on the environment, on human health, on food justice issues, and of course on the countless number of animals who are being um, killed unnecessarily for food. So as activists then, it's really important that we have a global perspective and we think, spend some time, money, and energy thinking about how we can address um, this glow growing gro global problem. Um, so what I'd like to do now is spend the next few minutes giving you some examples of some of the projects that Veg Fund has supported abroad and that are making a really positive impact across the globe. Um, there isn't enough time to go into very much depth, but my hope is that this will give you just a few examples that will inspire you to start thinking about what the different possibilities are and to possibly either get involved with groups by volunteering for groups that are doing great work already, or if you have connections um, outside the U.S. to start some of your own really innovative projects. So I want to start by having us travel about 3,000 miles south to a small village outside of Lima, Peru. And a few months ago, in late March, a group called Anima Naturalis created a program called Healthy Lunch Boxes. And they invited low-income community members to come to an event where they would learn how to prepare healthy vegan versions of traditional Peruvian fare for their children. And the community wasn't familiar with veganism. Many of them had never heard the word, had no idea what it was. So the organizers of the event were a little bit nervous that they were going to get a lot of pushback and a lot of resistance to their message. Um, much to their surprise, however, the project was an overwhelming success. Um, here's just a couple pictures from the event. They had 60 people attend the event, and it included a cooking demonstration. They got to sample the food that was prepared, and they also all went home with educational literature and recipes so that they could continue to make some of these healthy recipes at home for their children. Um, the event was scheduled to last for about an hour, but everybody was so engaged and had so many great questions that it ended up going for two and a half hours. Um, they asked the group to come back, they want them to do more classes, and the group is planning to do a bunch of other cooking demonstrations in that area. Um, so projects like this are really great because they're sensitive to the local culture, like Michael had mentioned, being really important, and they're also empowering women to make healthier choices for themselves and for their families. Um, and then that information, beyond just the 60 people who attended this event, they're going to go out into the community and tell their friends and neighbors and other community members about this, so it helps spread the information. So moving on, um, because we're all environmentally conscious, let's hop on our bikes and now head west into um, Brazil um, to take a look at the work that Vedas is doing. Um, so, VEDAS is a, a nonprofit organization and they do a number of really great events to further animal rights. Um, but what I'd, what I'd like to focus on today is their um, mobile video street outreach. And I'll put up a couple more pictures here. Um, so, VEDAS operates in the streets, um, different streets in the cities of Brazil, um, using multimedia equipment. So, you can see um, the first image at the top is their mobile cart, which they can use um, to show images to the public and videos to the public. Um, the image on the bottom is their van. And um, this allows them, like I said, to show images to the public in busy places. Um, the videos are often exposing people for the very first time to the realities of the animal agriculture industry. And as you can see in the second photo there, it's often a very powerful reaction. People had no idea where their, their food was coming from. Um, and given that Brazil is one of the biggest exporters and also one of the biggest consumers of the flesh of cows, um, the work that they're doing to inform the public is so important. Educating young people about these issues, getting young people involved to start making a difference and changing the trend that's happening over there. Um, on a similar note, Vedas does an excellent job of mobilizing volunteers. Um, as a result, they do this form of outreach multiple times every week. Um, and they plan to have six multimedia units in operation by the end of the year. So they're growing all the time. So it's amazing work. They do a lot um, with very little. So, and George from Vedas is right here in the front. So. <laughs> Definitely, I encourage you to talk to him and see how you can support their group. Like I said, they're doing great things. Um, so in addition to the, the in-person video outreach, there's another form of video outreach that I'd like to talk to you about 
which is online video outreach. And currently, VegFund is supporting multiple activists and nonprofit organizations to run online vegan ad campaigns. Um, and the way this works is that ads are created on platforms like Facebook, YouTube, Google AdWords, and then these ads direct to a website where people see footage, often undercover investigation footage, um, and they also have access to follow-up resources like a vegetarian starter kit. So the example I have up here are some ads from a Spanish language campaign and a Portuguese language campaign. Um, these ads are focused on animal cruelty, the environment, and health, respectively. Um, the first ad, for those of you who can't um, read Spanish, is says, um, stop the abuse, click to help animals. And when they click on that, they're taken to the website, which you see on the right, where they see a Spanish dub version of glass walls in order a veg starter kit. Um, they can also um, leave comments on the site. So a lot of people, again, are seeing this information for the very first time. Understandably, they're very upset by the information. They're angry. They're sad. They want to know what they can do to get involved. So most of the activists running this kind of campaign have a team of volunteers that are um, helping respond to the comments and engage these individuals. Um, so these campaigns are being run worldwide. There's campaigns currently in Australia, Brazil, um, to Chinese language campaigns, um, India, throughout all of Latin America, in Spain, the UK, here in the US, um, and it's growing all the time. Um, as we find activists from different parts of the world that speak different languages, we're expanding out to those areas as they're able to run campaigns. Um, these are, this is the impact that the online campaigns had in um, 2012. 2013 will be even bigger, but in 2012 there were 24 million um, video clicks almost 400,000 clicks on vegetarian starter kits, and this is costing only about five cents to expose people to this information. So the online video outreach can be a really cost-efficient way to reach a large number of people on a global scale. Um, it's great for people who have um, skills in technology and um, who might want to operate behind the scenes, so some people who might be comfortable doing the in-person outreach can do the um, online outreach and engage with people that way. And then the very last project that I want to tell you just really briefly about um, is a vegan activist who is also a Peace Corps volunteer started a project in a small village of Burkina Faso, which is in West Africa. Um, it's the red in the, on the map, the little pink area. And this project empowers poor communities by teaching them how to grow and harvest soybeans and then use those soybeans to create tofu, soy milk, soy, soy yogurt. Here's a couple of photos here. Um, the photo on the top is an instructor who's showing um, the community members how to make tofu. Um, and then the woman on the bottom is tasting the soy milk that she made for the very first time. And the really cool thing about this, product, um, this project is that it's improving people's health, it's um, improving their financial status as they can sell the excess product that they produce, um, and it's also re reducing their reliance on non-human animals. Um, it requires a very small investment for this particular project. They just needed very basic supplies, things like seeds, a grinder, um, a stove, um, things of that nature. And it's going to have a lasting impact for the animals and the environment and for their health. Um, and it's great because it's self-sustaining. Um, once it starts, um, people can use the income to then expand out. Um, they also have an agreement where the women who go through this um, training then uh, agree to train three other women in their community. Um, so far, about 300 people have been impacted through this, and just recently, one of the, the schools in this area, the primary school and the high school, are now going to adopt um, soy products in their canteen in this upcoming 2013-2014 school year, and that's going to reach about four, over 400 students. So it's, it's really incredible what they're doing. Um, so yeah, a little bit can go a really long way in these areas. So I just want to end by saying that I hope um, I inspired you to think about some of the, the wide array of projects that can be done abroad um, and to just remember the importance of not just looking here in the U.S. to do outreach, but there's also, like I said, it's a global problem and it's growing all the time, but there are some really cool things that are being done that we can get involved with. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can get in touch with me through our website or talking to me afterward. We're definitely happy to hear any ideas you have and any questions. So. Thank you.
All right. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, we're about to close out the conference soon. My name is Dawn Moncrief. I'm with A Well-Fed World, and that is awfw.org for our video audio listeners. And uh, we are similar in how we run uh, our, some of our campaigns to Veg Fund and the Sabina Fund. So I was actually at Farm for eight years, and when I spun off a well-fed world to work on the hunger connection specifically, uh, we used Sabina Fund as a model. So giving out $1,000 grants um, as kind of a baseline, and then uh, partnering and adopting, like Michael was saying. So we do the, the individual grants, uh, it's again very culturally sensitive. People are already successful in their own communities, so that we're not imposing our model on them, and again, the, the value of the dollar. So there's a lot of overlap, obviously, with uh, the benefits of, of working in the international community. Uh, one of the ones I also like to focus on is that when the institutions are in, is entrenched as much, so to try to stop it before it really gathers momentum, uh, is, a, is a benefit in some of the, the lower income countries uh, where we do a lot of our focus uh, as well as just other types of where we're exporting factory farms and things of that nature to try to stop that momentum. And also there's a lot of good that can be done. Um, again, we work on factory farming and animal consumption issues, so we, we work on the food issues. Is that when you're not consuming a lot, the impact of the growth is so much more. So that's when we're starting to talk about the doubling of meat consumption from 2000 to 2050 because you've got half the world's population eating more animal products. And when you're talking about those kinds of numbers, it doesn't even take much of an increase to make a huge difference. So if you actually are making significant increases, it's even that much more. And uh, so again, if we can kind of limit that and try to get to it before, before it really starts. Um, some of the, the projects that are my favorite uh, is one that we actually did have a hand and helping create, and that is a feeding program in Ethiopia's capital. And we helped uh, support Ethiopian Vegan Association, which was just starting. And we were like, oh, you know, maybe you want to be vegetarian, and maybe vegan will throw people off. And they're like, no, we're vegan. And they were, we're vegan, and they do advocacy. And we were able to um, send over Keith McHenry, who is the co-founder of Food Not Bombs, to work with the International Fund for Africa and the New Ethiopian Vegan Association, and they partner up a lot, and to train them on how to gather food to get donations and, and buy food at low cost and bring that into this um, area at a cathedral where a lot of homeless people are and to distribute that. And it started off as a monthly program, again, that was 2010, but it started to falter. You have a turnover of people and, and some of the leadership wasn't as strong as it could have been. And so we went back in 2012 and I was really nervous because I went this time, I'm bringing him, we've already invested $10,000 in this program and I'm thinking it might fail and it's, it's my, my baby of a, of a program because it's just so meaningful to be able to, to provide food uh, for, for people in need at this level. Um, but it was actually, um, and I'm wearing my shirt for uh, the vegan food partners, and that is with the International Fund for Africa and the Ethiopian Vegan Association and the Well-Fed World. We did a conference there, and Keith, he just sat in this little chair, and he, he mobilized people. I didn't even realize how effective he was being. And we were gonna do the, the feeding, and I thought, oh, I don't know, I don't, I'm really nervous about how it's gonna turn out. And they were late with the food, and I was like, oh my gosh, and people had started lining up. I was getting really anxious. And, they were late, but they got there, and they had 100 packets of food. So it's not just one meal, it's packets, it's pre-packed, really warm, delicious, Ethiopian, healthy food that they were able to distribute. And there's, it was 100 packets, it cost $60. $60. And this was a new, younger, energized crowd, very uh, theoretical also in their strategies, and now they're doing this weekly. Every Saturday, they are making this happen. And it's incredible, and uh, it, it just, I was very conscious during the Ethiopian famine, and uh, Ethiopia and Haiti are both very close to my heart. So for us to be able to actually be a part of something like that, but still being very culturally sensitive. So we brought Keith in, he's got a lot of international experience working within that, the culture and the resources that were available. So that's, that's uh, one that I'm particularly proud of. Uh, the other group we're partnering with, um, and that's one we've adopted. I, I don't usually use that word, but I like that Michael 
um, use that. So we provide $5,000 annually to keep that going. And if there's anything special campaigns that we run, we send them some extra funding. And they also do advocacy as well. Uh, the other one is the Federation for Indian Animal Protection Organizations, FIAPO, and uh, they have developed a large-scale vegan outreach program in Mumbai. And this is specifically uh, fashioned after vegan outreach, and so they've talked with them about strategies, and we work together on creating the booklets, and they're extremely strategic. For, for those of you who like metrics, uh, it's incredible uh, what they're able to do, and also with the, the value of the dollar. They're actually able to pay staff and give volunteers to, to build other communities. And so this is very much a model project that they are um, getting out to other, other areas. And again, we worked with them on that, uh, like focusing on dairy. So I really wanted to increase the focus on dairy because that's big in India. And then the brochures are in Hindi and English. So really exceptional stuff. Uh, and we work uh, annually with them as, as well. Uh, the other one uh, that we just recently helped with was the tour in Mexico. So I wish I had more information on how to send people overseas. I know that that was popular when we first talked about it. And uh, since most of the work we do is with groups that are already doing, doing what they do, uh, we don't have a, a system to, to send people over. Dance lineup. Oh, oh, this is a really interesting one. Uh, this is also just innovative and thinking outside the lines in Kenya. Uh, there's a, a village uh, where they're, they're working on uh, uh, like artifacts and tourist type things for the women's community. And I was like, well, that's, that's great, but I don't see how that, that fits in with what we're doing as well. But it actually helps um, shift people away from bushmeat. So instead of capturing the animals for bushmeat, it's giving them an alternate source of income. And so that was really exciting and something that we hadn't thought about. Uh, while we're focused on food and especially for people in need, uh, we also do work on animal care and rescue. Again, in India, so much can be done. There's a plastic cow project you might have talked to, um, Eileen, uh, it, it help with Help Animals India, and we work through her. So she basically does what we do, but in India. So she knows the, all those smaller projects in India, and we we, she helps us connect with them. And so there's this project called the Plastic Cow Project where the, the cows graze literally on landfills that are in the city. And then the debris gets caught in their stomach and they die a very slow, painful death. And there's uh, surgeons who are able to work on them, but they still need some money. And for $90 a piece, we're able to, to help provide surgeries to, to help these cows. And then they stay at the sanctuary afterwards. And they also just had uh, 146 cows and buffalo saved from slaughter. Their, their truck got uh, deterred and uh, the, the the animals didn't go to slaughter, they went to a sanctuary, and we were able to raise $16,000 to to send to them to help care, because that actually it was a 300 sanctuary, uh, and that's a lot of extra cows. That's 50% increase, and it was happening during drought season. So we've got lots of common overlap. I want to leave time for, for questions. That's a little bit of what we do. We also do focus on advocacy, and I do speaking on the connections with, with global hunger. So it's, it's, uh, not more, it's more than just grants and partnering, uh, but it is very much that. That's the cornerstone. And at our table, a well-fed world, the orange one in the main lobby area, I've got a booklet that talks about the Ethiopian India projects as well as our grants. We've given out about 150. We actually do a lot more in Africa, but we don't do as many in the other countries. So uh, thank you very much. Again, my name is Dawn Moncrief with the well-fed world, and I'm going to turn it over to our case study. Hello everyone, my name is Lee Chantel and I live mostly in Australia, um, in Brisbane. And um, lately I have been travelling quite a bit and I enjoy travelling and I've been in Southeast Asia for six months. So I do a lot of work in Australia and I'll, I'll talk a bit, about, um, a bit about that but mostly I'm going to talk about my travels in Southeast Asia. So um, you might know my website called vivalavegan.net. It's been going since 2005 and um, I say it's a multimedia hub for um, people to connect with other people in a positive and an empowering way about veganism because I believe in promoting the positive. And um, I also run a not-for-profit environmental awareness group called Green Earth Group. And we put on two um, really successful festivals in Brisbane in Australia. And we also had some funding um, from VegFest for our second festival for that. And I love the work that both these ladies do. 
and um, so they're my two sort of things that I do in Australia a, a lot of online stuff and a lot of in-person stuff so for Green Earth Group we have a lot of regular events letter writing um, video viewings um, some a lot of food outreach and some potlucks but I decided to go to Southeast Asia for six months, um, mostly just to chill out and work on some books I was in the middle of writing. Um, but as, as always happens in my life, two weeks into my trip, I met the um, Indonesian Vegetarian Society general manager and she invited me to come and talk at all these events. And I pretty much had no plans. I had booked my return ticket and I had booked my first week of accommodation. So I said, sure let's go for it and pretty much I spent half of my time in Indonesia I participated in a lot of um, talks I had a translator with me all the time so um, I had an Indonesian translator I spent a lot of time in Indonesia but I also was in Thailand Vietnam Laos and Malaysia so um, but I, I really adore Indonesia and the people there I had a translator so I would give talks mostly on why vegan and um, because I was speaking to a lot of Buddhists um, I would just explain why there's a problem with eggs, why there's a problem with dairy because a lot of people got the vegetarian thing but they didn't really get the other, the other issues. So I would explain that a lot and I also gave a lot of food demonstrations. So I taught people how to make um, cheese sauce. I have a lot of videos on my YouTube channel. If you just go youtube.com forward slash vivalavegan.net and just spell all that, you can see all my videos. And I showed people how to make this. And one of the, one of the ingredients is nutritional yeast. And for us over here, it's really, really easy to find nutritional yeast wherever you go. But in Indonesia and in a lot of other places, it's really hard to find it. So I could buy nutritional yeast for $12 um, at an organic store or um, you, you, I wouldn't be able to make this, um, the cheese. So for a lot of people, $12 is a lot of money to put into something. So you really have to keep these things in mind. And for me going overseas, I really learned a lot about um, different people and how to um, treat different people and um, also try my, I think the biggest lesson that I like to express to other people is just to not judge people on where you are and where you are in your world or where you live because it's so easy for people if you live in New York and you're in this little um, vegan hub to really not understand where people are in their life and what they can afford, what they can't afford, what their cultures and their religious um, like lifestyles prevent maybe prevent them from actually doing so um, one thing in particular we had a lot of like I said a lot of events at Buddhist um, uh, places and temples so in Indonesia the large majority of that population is Muslim so you're already distancing yourself from a lot of a lot of people in the community because they don't actually come into anyone else's um, temples so I sort of brought that up with a lot of people as well to get to the people that you need to be getting to in the mainstream. You need to be thinking outside the square and going to different places. Um, we did, um, over Christmas, we had like a four day event and I was like the face of the um, Tempe where we made a hundred meters. I'm not sure what that is in miles, sorry. Um, but we made a hundred meters of Tempe and I adore tempeh and um, I learned how to make tempeh and tofu when I was in Indonesia and it was just this massive length of tofu just up on, on, this, on this stage and then we had a lot of press, we had a lot of publicity for the event and we also had a lot of people make tempeh dishes and we had over a hundred, maybe 120 dishes of tempeh being made. So, and the, if you can imagine at the end there was like a swarm of people just going for all this food. It was quite um, amazing to watch actually. And that was really good just to, to show people how easy it is to make all these different foods. And I had like um, tempeh pudding, tempeh cake, and all the other other things tempeh can can make. Um, I um I, f I find with people that um just based I found I found myself um, thinking that I need to learn a lot more languages as well because I only speak English and I know a bit of German a bit of um and a bit of Chinese but um I. Th 
all these people I would meet overseas can at least speak three different languages and speak English really well, better than a lot of my friends back home. And um, it was amazing to think that they can speak in my language, they can speak in their language, and they can speak other languages. And I would really strongly suggest if you want to go somewhere else that you learn some like basic skills, basic language of another area, even just please and thank you, like that's just the basic sort of stuff. I was planning on going to six countries in six months, so I couldn't really learn six languages, but I really wish I had, I had just done the basics. Um, I ended up doing, just traveling around and I pretty much, I just like going, seeing where the wind takes me type thing and I just traveled around and met lots of people and then I would meet someone they say, come to this, do this, you should meet this person. So I just sort of saw where things took me. Um, a lot of people didn't really understand why I was so excited about all this pauper food because um, like other people have mentioned before, a lot of people overseas are now um, really impressed with the um, animal products and animal based diet and that's a sign that, um, that they like have better status than other people because they haven't been able to afford that in, in the past so now that they can so a lot of people are eating more of this food. And so that's another hard one um, to try and market to people that, you know, the beans, the rices, the tempehs, the soybeans, that that is actually a good food and you don't just have to have the pauper food or the really sort of stuff like that. Um, I volunteered and I met quite a few different organisations and someone asked about that before. So um, there's various organisations that you can volunteer at and work for. I would suggest you just go somewhere like Happy Cow, like a restaurant, a local restaurant where you are and just have a look on their board. There's always some sort of sign or something put up there where you can find what's happening in the area or just Google what's there. Um, there's a place called Yogyakarta in, um, in Java in Indonesia and they call it Jogja for short and there's a place called Animal Friends Jogja and they rescue a lot of dogs and cats. They do a lot of um, really cool stuff with dolphins and anti-dog fighting as well. And I know they're always willing to have volunteers. There's also Bawa, which is in Bali, an animal um, welfare um, organization, and Jan in Jakarta. I also went to, one of my favorite things was meeting the orangutans in Sumatra, and I also went to Thailand to the Elephant Nature Park, and it's the only place in Thailand, pretty much, this is in Chiang Mai, up north, where they don't encourage people to ride elephants, which is really quite um, shocking to see. Um, and it was just beautiful. You got to wash the elephants, and it was just gorgeous. I love elephants, so it was just beautiful. So you can actually stay there. There's, they have over 50 elephants. They have about 200 dogs as well. So that's an easy place that you could you could go tomorrow if you wanted to. Um, there's different ways that, um, all, like Michael was saying before, animal abuse happens all over the world. Same sort of things. But some people don't see the abuse like we would see it. So say, for example, people over here are horrified if something happens to a dog or cat, whereas that doesn't really mean that much in some, in some places overseas. So I would suggest that you really get to know the locals. Like, you can just walk around. I like getting a map of somewhere I'm going to and just walk around and find, you know, oh, where does that street go to or where does that go? Just meet the locals and find out what they're into. Just get someone to take you around for the day and see see the things that are there. Um, and um, try not to try not to get um, like I think Michael was saying to come in and be the saviour. So work with the groups that already exist is probably a, a really good thing to do first. Um, if if you don't agree with the, the groups that are there, you can always um, offer some suggestions or just go in and just work with someone for a while and just see maybe the things that need to be focused on a bit more and um, just think outside of the square with things. And definitely like $200 of your money here can go so much further 
overseas than it can here. So if you have any spare money, if you have any spare time, I definitely suggest that you go overseas. And um, yeah, it just it's just amazing to, it opens your, your mind to just so many different people. There's so many different ways to react and interact with people. So I strongly suggest that people go somewhere that they haven't, and especially somewhere that speaks a different language than you speak. So I'm, I'm open to answer any questions about if people wanted to go to a particular area that I've been. I've blogged about my adventures in Southeast Asia, so if you went to vivalavegan.net and in the update section, um, so from August to February, there's a lot of information there where I went, what I saw, lots of food photos and animal photos, so have a look at that. But thank you and we'll listen to your questions. Questions and also uh, we have a lot of international activists here, so if you have something to, to say, um, you know, please. One of the things I liked about doing international conferences, I don't like to travel, but I've just met so many incredible people and gotten to know so many groups. Yes, please. Um, well, like, uh, every problem I've ever had with, like, if I'm talking about um, dealing with, like, hunger in like other countries, um, I just like talking about that and then bringing up like vegan and that even conversation. Like in my experience, people get really offended like immediately, which sucks, you know what I mean? Like, you know, they're like, oh, well, why would you worry about them eating meat when people are starving? Like, you know, I, I mean, I realize that, you know, all life is equally important and everything, but like, how, how do you guys like combat that argument? Well, first off, I make it clear that uh, our focus is more also on the over-consuming and yeah. high-consuming countries like going over, vegan, yeah. um, people who have plenty of choices. Uh, we don't uh, get involved too much with people who don't have choices in their calories. Yeah. So if you have f people who don't have many options, but what you don't want to come in is We're with a meat-centered paradigm, right? And there's so many better ways to do things oftentimes with community gardens, so not to assume that animal-based um, solutions are the, the best. Okay. Uh, and uh, we've got all the resource inefficiencies and factory farms being imported into the countries under the guise of food security. Yeah. But what it really does is it brings men into the workforce and undermines women's sustainable farming and power. And so there's all kinds of problems as well, the environmental and animal problems and things of that nature. So they're, they're very connected. And you also have uh, low-income countries exporting food to be used as feed for high-income countries. Right. Uh, so it's a, it's a real food drain. And, um, very, very high populations of hungry people in Ethiopia, you know, they're exporting food for feed for a lot of it, Middle Eastern and things of that nature. Uh, so, thanks. Yeah. And we can talk more to, to fine tune that. Okay. I, I like to say I care about them both equally, yeah. so that's yeah, I mean, just a do basic I. way to. Yeah. It's just, I don't know, it's like people get offended. I'm not trying to take food out of someone's mouth, I just trying to get more. Yeah. Right, and exactly. It, and if you think of trying to say to someone, you know, I'm trying to like help you get empowered or something along those sort of lines. Yeah, animals used for food um, are also a lot of takes a lot of food to feed them, right. a lot of water. They need medical care, so it's it's not just a, an easy solution. And our websites have have a lot of information on that. Hi, yes. Um, Anyhow, uh, I teach at a university down in South Carolina, College in Charleston, and uh, I teach mathematics, but uh, we have, during our spring breaks, we have these alternative spring breaks. We try to encourage students to do something where they can actually have an impact and, and contribute in some way, volunteer, do some things. And I've got a friend of mine back at the college, another colleague, and she and I have been trying to find ways that maybe we could get some kind of animal rights, veganism, some sort of thing, uh, going where we could get, we've got a pretty good vegan club and we've got students who like to go abroad and practice their language skills and so on and we'd like to see if we can get them doing some things and so what she and I are looking for right now are really trying to find contacts, maybe places where people are already doing things where we could go in as a, as a group, volunteer, do whatever sort of grunt work needed to be done, maybe homestays where students could stay with families, work on their language skills and yet during the day be able to uh, do whatever needed being done, you know, maybe work at animal shelters, work at, uh, you know, who knows, uh, those are the things that I'm looking for ideas and places that you folks may know about that, uh, or, or contact places where I can find information to try to, uh, you know, 
hooked us up with some people that we could use as an alternative spring break site. Mm -hmm. There's many, many, I think. It, I think you need to work out maybe what area you want to go, what the budget is, how many people would be involved, and then like do a bit more research in those sort of areas. The places I mentioned before would be okay with those sort of things, especially the Elephant Nature Park in Thailand. They've got a massive space, so they'd be able to put 30 plus people up there quite easily. You can easily stay at homestays all throughout Asia. It's very, very cheap. Like you wouldn't have to pay a thousand dollars or something. Like probably yeah, Asia is a little bit of a trouble for us right now. Yes, yeah, really because not. Uh, our spring break is about a week long, and we've been mostly going to Latin American countries, Nicaragua, okay. Dominican Republic, some of these places that we can actually get to in you know a half a day. Uh, mm -hmm. I loved it. I just got back to China, but I, okay. I took a group of uh, math students there, yeah. and uh, you know, as you well know, well maybe not from Australia, but from here, it's a full 24 hours plus traveling, and so that kind of made me choose yeah. two full days in the. Yeah. So yeah, look at Latin American. We've got great activists here from Latin and South America that can maybe point you in the right direction. Yeah, and feel free to get in touch with me. Well, I'm in touch with a okay. lot of people from the Latin America that are doing amazing work there. So okay. yeah, if you get an idea of pin down the region more, just get in touch with me and I can um, connect you with some people. Okay, sounds good. Can you talk some more? Okay. Uh, I just want you to uh, thank and uh, point out how, how important it is for I want to thank these organizations that have been supporting the work abroad and point out how important it is to, to support grassroots activists. Uh, it was mentioned in this morning plenary that the fifth largest uh, food company in the U.S. is actually a Brazilian company, which is JBS, which is a, a, a meat uh, producer. So if they're that powerful here in the U.S., you can only imagine how much how powerful that industry is. In Brazil, 75% of our Congress representatives are also cattle ranchers. Wow. So, uh, so even when you look at a, like emerging uh, economies where the economy is doing good, but then it is doing good exactly on oil and, and meat production and forest destruction. And so, uh, it is we it is hard to get local support because, it, uh, especially because there's not a, a culture of, of of donating or uh, the, that market is really big, but it, it kind of drew from exporting, so the, the activists didn't have the time to catch up with the size of the problem, so it was just, uh, suddenly it, it, it was there before our culture was ready for that. So again, uh, thank you for, for doing, supporting the, the grassroots that, that we're doing there. Uh, I'm talking about Brazil, but I can only imagine uh, in Asia and, and Africa how important that is as well. So technically our session is over, but um, we have a few more minutes. Um, and any any thoughts from our expertise? <laughs> Can I just comment on what you were saying? Uh, yeah. Oh, so, um, I was going to say like it's really good for for people to work like at the grassroots level, like you're saying, all these people are involved. It's similar to to us back home in Australia, like the oil. Um, um, and mining is massive, like that's where we got a lot of our income from. And I think it's really good to, to meet people in areas and just show them, like if you take control back of your food and it, these sort of processes, these people aren't, you know, hurting our area and you can, you can have your own job, you can be self-sustainable for your family. Things like that I think work, but that's more like a one-on-one -on -one with a family thing. I go. Uh, one, uh, one, one topic which was on my mind while well, well, hearing the presentation. I think there's this two two areas uh, I think where we need to work more on. One is definitely supporting groups in areas where where they can really need it, where the meat consumption or, or uh, animal product consumption is currently increasing in Asia, in Africa, probably also in, in Southern America. Um, that's that's definitely important. But what I also think is important to try to collaborate more together with groups all over the world so that we can also do more global campaigns as I think uh, what, what uh, Michael was also saying being that the meet out is, is a really great example of, of uh, like an action day which has uh, picked up all over the world. There's, there's groups in Germany, probably like 30, 40 groups that are participating in, in this uh, meet out and I guess they're all over the world. So those kinds of action days are really great to 
to bring animal uh, rights groups from all the, over the world together to to work on, on one topic and to also exchange ideas on, on how to do it better and see what, what's happening in the world. And maybe we can come up with some kind of action days or even campaigns. So currently I'm not aware of any really active campaign which is really global. So there's of course Shag, there's, there's Gateway to Hell, there's certain kinds of campaigns which are taking place in different countries, but there's no really global campaign currently going on. The last one I can remember was the the Escada campaign, which, which had really protests all over the world, protesting against uh, fur at Escada. But maybe we can come up with some more campaigns and some more action days where we can actually connect more globally to, to exchange ideas and get together and, and yeah, make it a more global fight against animal exploitation. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. I think with social media today, it's a lot easier for people yeah. to connect and all the different platforms, change.org and things like that. It makes it easier to get involved on a global scale. And I think we, we have the days as far as we have World Farm Animals Day on October 2nd, Gandhi's birthday, which is a farm uh, founded uh, 1981 and, or 1983 maybe, and uh, World Vegetarian Day, so but increasing, yeah. uh, increasing around that. And of course, Meat Out, like you said. I think in Europe it's just Meat Out and World Vegan Day are also, is also, I don't know, 1st of November, if that's... Yes. Right, right, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's, that, that's the only two days I can think of. December 10th, International yeah. Rights Day yeah. in the UK. What is that? Yeah. International Animal Rights Day in Spain, in the UK, yeah. December 10th. Yeah. There's, a, there's a lot of things that are happening like around mm. the world, um, but maybe just Google a few things. Yeah. And I think with Meetout it's really great because they have this, this more or less global platform where people can also see what other groups are yeah. doing. And at least in, like, there's a special Meetout website in Germany where all the German groups put their actions on and, and in other countries that's, that's, they have that similar. So that really, or I guess, what, what was also mentioned, the, the, the solidarity protest for, for the Spanish 12 was yeah. also one, it was not a nice uh, reason why, why it was taking place, but it also showed again that, mm. that there's animal rights activists all over the world. It's really nice to see that also in India people were protesting for people in, in Spain. I yeah. think you can use already existing things like Earth Day, like something like that to get involved in your in your area and promote veganism. Just whatever day people are, are celebrating something, even Thanksgiving or Christmas, like those big days are good to to do that. We're getting a okay. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, five thirty, I didn't realize the plenary actually started at five thirty, so that's um, it's about to Thank start. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.